So welcome to Wool & Spinning. My name is Rachel. I can be found pretty much everywhere as well for pearls. Um, thank you for joining us. If you're new to the show, thank you so much for checking us out. And if you're a returning viewer, thank you so much for checking us out week after week. Um, and a special thank, thank you to our Patreon community. You guys are the ones that keep the show on the air month after month. You're the reason that I create all of the content every month that I do, and I really enjoy doing that. You're also the reasons um, for Wool & Spinning Radio remaining a thing. It's the audio podcast that goes with Patreon. Um, you guys keep all of that alive and, and I, I'm really appreciative so thank you so much in today's show we have a quick I didn't give away a calendar last show this is for the patrons of our community so I have that to give away today and I also have an ask anything that was um, Lizzie H's question in our ask anything thread in the Ravelry group if you're wondering for, about links for some of this stuff it will be posted um, on wellforpearls.com as well as patreon.com slash wellforpearls. So you can have a look at um, links, join the Ravelry group if you haven't already, and um, hop in on the conversation. And if you're wondering more about wanting to know about the Patreon and everything, just hop over to patreon.com slash wellforpearls. It's all there, the information is quite clear. Um, and then we also have a spinning growth segment that is from Sarah. I thought this one, I've been kind of saving this one because it's a really, really interesting one. And I have a couple of uh, finished objects that I um, finished over the weekend. It's um, loosely finished. I will explain. One thing was an epic fail. Um, and then I just wanted to chat really quickly about this beautiful yarn that's down here. Um, I finished it over the weekend. It was a very, very fast spin. I did it in under an hour and I was just going to very quickly chat about it. Um, so for the calendar giveaway from through Patreon, this is for our patrons of the show. Um, I give one away every month. This month, I, my, my calendar from last year is on October. Um, that's what the front looks like. This, the calendar for 2019 um, has some new photos in it. Um, it's a little bit different in terms of the layout um, because the 2017-2018 calendar um, it was just time for a mix up. I've had some new yarns, some new projects that I've worked on and I thought that uh, I would revamp some of the photos. So this is actually going to Sharon, AKA the Village Weaver, who's part of our Patreon community. So congratulations, Sharon. And I will message you through Patreon to get your address because um, I don't have it. So thank you so much. Before we move on, I'm going to talk really, really quickly about this project that I'm working on. This is in Commercial Yarn. Um, this is for Kelly, who just joined us, which is awesome. Hi, Kelly. Um, this is the Juniper Pullover. Um, this is by Ash Alberg. I think it's Alberg. A-H-L-B-E-R-G, I think. Alberg. Um, it's a really cute cardigan. This is the front. It's a reverse stockinette with um, a single knit stitch going up the front. And what makes this pattern really interesting is that the actual pattern is knit in pieces. So you're supposed to knit the front and then you're supposed to knit the back separately. Um, you're supposed to knit from the hem to the uh, top of the um, shoulders for the front and the back. And then you seam down the sides and you uh, pick up. So it ends up being a drop shoulder because you've got quite a number of stitches that end up on hold here. And then you pick up um, around your the top of your bicep basically. I'll just turn so you guys can see that around here. And you knit down for the sleeve. That's it's very uh, common right now. I think a very common um, sh uh, construction for sweaters. There's quite a number of designers that are doing these drop, drop shoulder sweaters. I really like them. Unfortunately in worsted weight, because this is just Cascade 220, it's just from my stash. Um, I'm just trying to use stuff up to be honest. Um, I really wanted to spin for this sweater, but I wanted the sweater more <laughs> and I don't have any yarn that was suitable um, without really drastically changing the gauge. So I um, 
cast on in some in some leftover Cascade 220. And for those who are curious about this colorway, sorry for the banging with the mic. Um, the colorway is 2448. 2448. That's the color there. Um, it's a beautiful dark teal blue. It's one of my one of my favorite colors. Um, so I did not knit this in pieces uh, for two reasons. First of all, I didn't feel like I needed to. Um, the hem is knit separately. So I'm just gonna move this stuff out of the way and then um, I can show you down here, but I'm not gonna move the cameras around because I'm gonna put this on my dress form in a sec. So you knit the hems separately. So what I did was I cast on for the hem and then I, um, so I've got them here. I, I knit the hem um, and then when I was finished the first one, I broke the yarn and then I knit the second hem and then I and then I started working in the round. So I have two stitch markers um, on either side marking my uh, sides. There's no shaping in this sweater. It's just um, a straight up and down. It's just a box. So in this pattern, she calls for, what is it, Kelly? Like five to seven inches of positive ease. I didn't want to drop sweater, drop shoulder sweater with that much ease because there's just too much under here, especially when it's worsted weight for, for me. It's just not what I like. Um, so I knit up to the sleeve. So I'm knitting the smallest size, which gives me about, um, I think the smallest size is like 37 and a half inch bust. And my bust, my upper bust measurement is 33 inches. So it gives me about um, four inches of positive ease up through here. My waist is 29 inches. So it gives me some positive ease through my waist. Um, if you guys are wondering about a lot of ease, um, about ease, what's the word? Um, like measurements or like what should be um, like how things should quote unquote fit you. Amy Herzog is a great um, resource. I would really recommend that you read her Fit to Flatter. Is it Fit to Flatter, you guys? Um, that book, it, it just, it, not even for the patterns, just for the information that's in it. It's very simple, it's quick to read, it's easy. Um, so I knit up to the underarm. Um, oh, just one sec, Eve, about your question. Um, so I knit up to the sleeves and now I'm ready. I did three chart repeats. I'm not sure it's enough. I might do another half chart repeat. Um, let's see if I can get this in here. So we'll see if I can get this on my dress form without completely messing up. So. So the reason why I might add a chart repeat is because it might not be, uh, or uh, another half chart repeat is because it might not be long enough. Um, I like my sweaters pretty long because I'm really long torsoed. Um, my torso is about four inches longer than most conventional patterns. Um, so, that's a pretty significant difference. Um, and remember, this isn't blocked, so it's tight because it's not blocked. Because um, I find with Cascade 220, I can stretch it out quite a bit. So what I'm gonna do now, I might make this longer. This is pretty short for me. Um, I think from here to here, it's about 16 inches. And I like my sweaters to be at least 17, if not 18 or 19 inches. Because like I said, I'm about four inches longer in the torso than a conventional pattern is written for. Um, four inches is pretty significant. So like if a pattern is written for, like you know how sometimes patterns will say, um, knit four inches um, from the underarm down. And then they'll say, um, um, you know, and then begin side, side shaping from my underarm to my waist. So if the pattern is starting the, the, the hip shaping, cause sometimes patterns are written straight and then they flare out for the hips and they'll say knit four inches and then you start increasing for your hips. I'm nine inches from my underarm to my waist. So if I start increasing at four inches, I'm, I'm literally five inches short of where I need to be for my hips, where my hips start. And because I'm an hourglass, 
Um, so the width of my shoulders is the same as the width of my hips. Um, and my waist is 14 inches smaller than my hips, my fullest hips. That's a big difference. So you're not only are you increasing five inches higher on my waist th th than I than than my waist is, now I'm increasing out. Like the whole thing just boggles your mind. So this is where you really need to know your measurements. And if you don't know your measurements, get somebody else to measure you. So I trained my husband on how to measure me. Um, I showed him in the mirror what I needed him to do on me. And he's actually really good um, at measuring me now. So um, you need your waist, your waist, you need your upper bust, you need your bust, you need your upper arm, you need your wrist. Um, you need your, your back, um, shoulder blade to shoulder blade. There's a whole bunch of measurements, um, that you need to do. Um, do you take that measurement from like right in the armpit or slightly down? I feel like I should know that measurement on me. Um, I go the top of my bra. So if you dig your, your finger, your thumb into your side where the top of your bra is, that's where I measure from because it's not right in my armpit. It's where a sweater, an arm sky should comfortably hit, um, is right at the top of your bra. Um, and that's barring like weird bras. Like I'm talking about like just a conventional normal bra. <laughs> I never thought I'd be talking about bras on the on the podcast. Um, but like, so like not sports bras, not bras that like dip way down, not just cups. Like you need like like a proper, just a conventional bra. So the top of, of the bra. Um, and actually, it's funny because I didn't know that until um, I was reading a whole bunch of... Um, uh, sewing books, like just just regular old, they were like from the 70s and 80s, the the Threads magazine. I was looking through them, um, some of the archived stuff on on how to do measurements for sewing, and that was that that was what they said. So, um, oh hi Britta. Um, so I'm probably gonna make this longer. Um, but what I'm gonna do is um, to make this not a drop shoulder, I'm going to decrease under here, under the arm. So I'm, this is the side of my dress form. I'm gonna decrease about four inches on either side of the stitch marker. And then I'm gonna do about three decreases up the side as I build the back of the sweater. And the way that you keep track of that on the chart, because it's really difficult to write that out um, in a chart, um, for the for the pattern designer is I actually start highlighting the the rows in the chart that I've literally gotten rid of. So as you work your way across on either side, because the repeat of the chart is in the center, if I decrease, if I if I bind off four inches on the back side of my stitch marker, I literally. I use a highlighter so that I can use the pattern again if I want to knit it again in, in the um, in the future. I highlight four rows on each side of the pattern so that I know when I come to them in the chart repeat that those stitches literally don't exist anymore. So then in the chart itself, um, if I have a highlighted row and it's like, you know, here, then I know that that net, that sec that last stitch before um, on this side and again, and it's mirrored on the other side, so you have to do it on on both sides. Um, then I know that last that's that last stitch needs to be just a regular knit stitch, because so what so you use your highlighter rows as you get rid of stitches to. Um, determine where that last knit stitch is and you literally just ignore the pattern. So if it says, you know, knit two together, yarn over, and that's where you are in the chart, you just ignore that. Because if you yarn over and you don't do the, the knit two together, or if you knit two together and you don't do the yarn over, you've taken away or you've added a stitch, but you haven't compensated it for it with the decrease or the, or the yarn over. So I just ignore it and knit right till the end, turn, purl all the way back and then work the next row of the chart. Does that make sense? And that's how I work a more conventional arm sky so that when I graph these shoulder, the shoulder seams together, I now have a traditional arm sky and then I pick up around the arm sky and I work short, short rows back and forth to build the shoulder cap um, and, then, and then work the sleeve down. So you've, you've basically built a conventional sleeve. Does that make sense? Kelly, is that helpful? <laughs> um, 
Um, I think so, Jill. Does the top of the bra measurement work well for the extra endowed? I would think so, because what you're trying to get, the, the measurement that you're trying to achieve, um, I'm wearing a tank top, so I'll show you really quick. You're trying to get this measurement from here down to your waist, and my waist, where your natural bend is, is right here. So that's the measurement that you're trying to get, is from there to there, and then, of course, you want down to your hip. So for me, the top of my hip is 18, is from my, from my underarm to the top of my hip, um, which is that your hip bone, which is right here, um, is 19 inches, um, and from, my, from here, uh, my, my natural waist up to the top of my is, is nine inches. That You're not going for bust measurement there. If you're um, quite well endowed, then you're, you're, you've got other fitting stuff. Like you would probably want to work in a dart here. So you'd want to work in some sort of a bust dart. And there are some great tutorials on YouTube and um, um, Ravelry for for doing some of that or um, some people will so some people will do short rows in there so they'll work like an actual bus start um, and then other people will actually um, it's not a bus start but there's another way of of oh they'll do um, a, a dart actually I do this sometimes for certain sweaters they'll do a dart that comes down from here so um, it works really well with raglan sweaters so that they fit properly on your um, in the yoke. Um, you have your raglan stitches coming down like this, right? If you increase down here, straight down the middle of the raglan, so you've got the raglan here, or if you've got a round neck cardigan or, or sweater, it doesn't matter, and then you've got your raglan here, if you increase straight down here, um, I usually add about three to four stitches depending on my gauge. So I'll increase every, like, if I'm knitting in the round, I'll increase like every three rows. If I'm knitting back and forth, I'll increase every, like, depending on my gauge, if it's a worsted, I'll increase every four rows. If it's um, a light fingering or a sport, I'll increase every two rows. Um, and you put those increases in in the same spot straight down. That will give you the illusion of a bust start and it'll give you more room through here. And then it's up to you after you get to your waist, whether you get rid of those stitches or not. I usually leave them because my hips are so wide and I don't mind a bit of positive ease through through here. Um, if you have ease through your waist and it's a little bit tighter across your bust, a sweater, if it's tighter across your bust, tighter across your hips and loose in your waist, it gives the illusion of, looking, of making you look slimmer regardless of your size or shape, regardless of whether you're a pear or an apple, it gives you the illusion of being slimmer which is kind of nice. So, um, yes, Becca agrees, ease in the waist is so important. And also for movement, like it's really hard to move in a sweater if it's tight in the waist as well as the bust and the hips. Um, it just isn't very comfortable. So, hi Megan. Um, Eve had a great question. So I'm gonna go scroll back up through the chat. Speaking of gauge, would you possibly be able to do a video or thoughtful spinner about adapting patterns for hand spun, choosing which fiber would be good, changing gauge, gauge etc. Okay, I um, that is a great question, Eve. Yes, we can talk about more. We can talk about that more um, in the um, in the future because that is definitely something that we can do. Um, all right. I'm wondering, Jill, if you're hearing the Slack notifications because the speaker was on. So I turned it off, so hopefully that will take care of it. Let me know if it's like really annoying. All right, uh, let's move on. So that is how I do this, and um, I will keep you posted on this project. I know it's not hand spun, but um, I thought that it was kind of an interesting, because I am modifying it quite heavily. So... Um, Lost a bunch of my stitches, so I will uh, keep you posted on how that goes. Maybe I'll be wearing it in one of the one of the podcasts coming up. Who knows? Who knows? All right, let's do um, our ask anything. Um, it goes a little bit along the lines of what Eve was asking about patterns and substitutions and stuff. I will be talking about this later in the show. So, um, okay, Lizzie had this great question in um, the uh, Ask Anything on Ravelry, um, and it was about um, matching, 
what to look for in a pattern when pairing hand spun with an off the shelf yarn. So it was post number 1167. So in ask anything, and when I say ask anything, like ask anything, we've had some really great discussions because of this, um, um, yeah, because of, because of that thread. So I wonder guys, um, bye Jill. Okay. Can you guys still hear me? I just want to make sure. I just muted something, so I just want to make sure you can still hear me. Um, when you're pairing hand spun with um, conventional yarn, there's what I look for, because I do this all the time, what I look for mostly is gauge. So there are lots and lots of things to think about when you're pairing hand spun and a conventional yarn um, or a commercial yarn I guess we could say the other thing that people don't I mean we don't even talk about this often but what if you're pairing two different skeins of your own hand spun and they were spun at different times and they weren't initially meant to go together they can be really different especially if the fibers are really different so one of the things that I look for is the fiber content and then the other thing I look for is gauge like I mentioned so let's talk about um, gauge first the only way to know with hand spun what your true gauge is, is by knitting with it. So what I generally will do is, is get it on the needles and do a four by four test knit swatch um, immediately. Um, if I'm really convinced that I wanna work with that yarn and that's the yarn that I'm gonna work with, doing that four by four swatch, you might feel like it's a waste of time or that you're wasting valuable hand spun. You can always rip it out if you need that yarn later. That was something Brenda Dane always used to talk about when she hosted Cast On, that the, the audio podcast from years ago. She always talked about ripping out her swatches and using the yarn in her garments and I think that's a really important thing because you really don't know what your gauge is going to be until you knit with your yarn and that can really inform what the knitted um, fabric will look like because sometimes you kind of have this idea like in the skein of what it might look like and then you start knitting with you and you're like oh that's not what I thought it would look like at all maybe there's a drape or maybe there's um you know that you didn't expect or maybe you prefer it knitted a tighter gauge because it's really light and airy and lofty and it could be really quite warm so if you knit it a little bit denser it'll look really awesome in in mitts or maybe it's quite um quite a dense yarn um but the fiber content lends itself really well to drape so if you knit it at a looser gauge it'll drape really nicely there's lots of things in that sense to think about and then with that knit swatch if you take that with you when you go to buy your commercial yarn can really inform what you're looking for um, I've put together worsted weight hand spun with sport weight yarn because the gauge worked really well um, so in theory the hand spun was worsted weight and it, it wrapped did my wraps per inch per a worsted weight but then you get like a really plump round sport or DK on the needles that's a commercial yarn and it knits more like a um, more like a um, a, a light worsted and so then you can put those worth that worsted weight with that plump DK or that plump sport weight and it works the only way to work it all out and to figure it out uh, is to knit with it that's the only way and do a striping um, swatch and again you can always pull it out if you need that yarn and if you don't want to buy commercial yarn because you don't want to buy it unless you're totally committed you probably need to figure out how committed to that project you are because to me if the yarn doesn't work, you're probably going to be able to find it something to do with for another project. Put it on Ravelry as that you will sell or trade it. Um, you can get rid of it, but you really have to figure out what your gauge is and what the fabric looks like, and then that can inform what you're going to buy in terms of the commercial yarn. The other thing is the fiber content. Like if you're, if you've spun, um, you know, a braid of like superwash BFL and you go out and you want to buy a skein of like, I don't know, a tweed that's like got some nylon in it. Um, maybe it's got some silk in there cause it's a tweed. Um, and it's a wool cross and it's like got all this other stuff going on and maybe it's a cabled yarn, but your BFL was a conventional two ply you're gonna have problems <laughs> because you've got two really really different yarns that you're trying to put together if that's what you want and that's the aesthetic you're going for that's awesome go for it 
but you sort of need to try to find two yarns that work really well together. Um, you know, for example, if you have a really wooly, like I'm going to use this yarn as an example. This is a Wensleydale. It's a single, it's a, it's a single ply or a, a singles yarn. Um, it's spun up to a worsted weight. I would even maybe say a light Aran, which is kind of pushing it, but I'm sure that I wouldn't want to knit it on anything smaller than about four and a half millimeter needles, maybe fours if I wanted a really dense fabric for like mittens. Um, I probably wouldn't go out and put this with a cabled yarn or with a multiply. Um, I probably wouldn't go out and put this, like you can even see just here on the live stream how much of a halo this has. Like it, even with the camera not in focus, which kind of works really nicely because then you can really see the halo. Um, I'm probably not going to go put it with like a really crisp, smooth, worsted spun, um, really like manufactured yarn. I'm probably going to lean more towards something that's like a um, a Cascade 220 Sport, which was a woolen spun two-ply yarn. We can't get it here anymore um, in this part of British Columbia. I'm sure others in other parts of the world can get it. Um, I would maybe put it, if I spun it even a little bit thicker, I'd maybe put it with Cascade Eco, which is a worsted, which is a woolen spun two-ply. Um, you you sort of, I think, I think when you pair hand spun with commercial yarns, it works really, really well when you have similar um, uh, spinning techniques that are done. So a, a woolen spun yarn paired with a commercial woolen spun. Um, a, 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 a hand spun tweed paired with a commercial tweed. I think that works really well and you can't really go wrong. And then the other thing is um, the the fiber content itself. So whether you're putting wool with wool, this is 100% Wensleydale. It's got a really beautiful sheen. It'd be great if I could, if I was going to pair it with something, it'd be great to find, you know, um, like what's the UK brand? Dove, Dove Stone? Those of you in Britain, do you guys remember, do you guys know what I'm talking about? What's that yarn called? Um, they, a lot of those yarns are longer stapled, so that might be a really good, um, like they're, you know, they're Teeswater, Cotswold, um, Border Lister, uh, BFL. It might be a good pairing. It might be terrible. So those are just some of the things that I like to think about um, when I am trying to figure out what I'm going to do with pairing hand spun with a commercial yarn. My favorite pairing is actually a, wor a worsted spun three ply paired with a worsted spun um, commercial yarn. I think it works the best. Um, that's just my own personal preference. I suspect I would like a four ply paired with a multiply as well. Um, I feel like you can't go wrong with two worsted spun yarns. Um, and I tend to pair with white or cream. That's just me. <laughs> I don't know why. I think because it highlights the, um, the hand spun and the colors in the hand spun. So then you've got color to think about too. So we could talk about this all day, but we're going to move on. Um, we have a um, spinning growth to talk about. So this is Sarah. Sarah wrote in the Ravelry group, and I'm actually just going to read what Sarah wrote. And this should cycle. These photos should cycle. Um, and you guys should see three different photos. I'm going to move things around. Um, so Sarah wrote, um, this is SJS Makes on Ravelry. This was in the spinning growth thread on our wool and spinning um, group. And it was post number 10. We're still on the first page of that of that thread. <laughs> and you guys are still throwing in projects, which is awesome. Please don't stop. Um, but one day we'll get through to the end and then we'll need more, more projects to talk about. So Sarah says this, let me tell you the story of my first hand spun sweater. Dot, dot, dot. It looks good in the photo, but in real life, it's super dense and heavy. It weighs more than one and a half pounds, despite having short sleeves and being a small size. Yet the yarn was a three ply with singles I spun long draw from bats. I processed from fleece. It should have been light and airy, right? No, it was the opposite of light and airy. I think this was my sample skein. So that was the last photo that you just saw. In retrospect, it looks a little overplied, so maybe that was part of the problem. I'm pretty sure I don't have any of the yarn left to check. 
I've been blaming it on the fiber. Never blame it on the fiber. <laughs> um, I say that tongue in cheek. Uh, the fleece was a Romney Cory Cross, Cory Dale, and had a pretty long staple. I've been avoiding Romney ever since. Oh, which is so bad, Sarah. Romney's amazing. Um, and so Cory, Cory Dale can be incredible. Um, but I've also shied away from the three plies for all of my subsequent sweater spins as well. So the first photo here is the unwashed fleece. So there were a couple of um, responses. So Florence responded with, thanks for sharing. I see what you mean about the plying. The cheviot I posted back um, above was put back through the wheel to take some of the ply twist out and it ha has improved it to no end. It is still cheviot dull, but is now lighter and softer. So that was, we talked about that spin that Florence did a while ago, we talked about that yarn. It was the rainbow. Um, roving that she had and she had spun it into two really beautiful skeins but that she felt were um, too dense and too over twisted and so we talked about putting it back through the wheel and taking some of that twist out um, and then Becca had a really lovely post as well where she encouraged her to um, not to shy away from some of these fibers that you feel like on first um, at first are, are that you don't have really great results from um, and that you know as you improve as a spinner um, you know you go back to some of these these blends or these fibers and of course you know there's improvement and it's really great I think what Becca uh, one of the the thoughts that Becca had was you know that you do improve as um, when you come back to these and you can see how your spinning has changed and I thought that was really um, a really great piece of advice so I had a couple of thoughts about this. I think, I don't think, Sarah, that your experience is unusual. I think many of us have had this experience in the past and we've all had situations where we we're really disappointed about the yarn that we ended up with. It's maybe too dense, too heavy, um, too thick, too high, high twist, all that different stuff. And of course, we're often told um, that having a uh, really really high twist yarn and a three ply are like the best combinations for a sweater I think we're told that for socks and then we're also told that for sweaters um, So I had a couple of thoughts the the skein that she posted the, the gray one which is actually on the screen right now It is pretty high twist. Um, you can see that really really tight nice really nice I really like it, <laughs> um, that really tight twist angle and then you can see here with the sweater um, that it's it's I would, I would, I think that the yarn is probably on the bulkier side because um, you can see even in this photo that's taken back from her because it's capturing from her hips all the way up to her head. Um, you can see the individual stitches. So I'm assuming that this turned out to be sort of a bulky-ish yarn, um, and which is which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. I suspect, and this is just based on not having the yarn in front of me and not seeing the yarn in front of me that your long draw wasn't as light and airy, like your singles, the long draw singles, weren't as light and airy as you think that they were. Um, and I think this is something that when we're learning how to do long draw and when we're first spinning, um, and we're first learning how to do some of these, some of these um, techniques, the, the yarns are not as light and airy as they, as we maybe plan them to be because we're adding so much twist um, because we are learning the technique. And even if it wasn't your first woolen spun yarn, um, when you're spinning that much fiber, especially when you're making a three ply and it's from a pound and a half, um, and depending on what your yardage was, it'd be really interesting to know what your yardage was so that we could find out what your grist was. So that's how much yardage you got per pound of fleece. Um, because this is a really good example and I, I have made stuff like this too where my grist was really high so my, my yards per pound was quite low um, and I didn't get very good yardage from the amount of fiber that I had and I was really disappointed. The sweater is beautiful. I love this pattern and I remember when you finished this and when you posted photos of it. Um, but I suspect if you had taken, um, if you ha long, when you're spinning long draw, you should only be putting enough, or should, spinning please, we're going to come to our, your house and arrest you. Um, just kidding. Um, 
you only want to put enough twist into your long draw singles to hold your singles together. So it, when you're adding twist into your singles, whether it's short forward, short backward, semi woolen, semi worsted, um, or long draw, um, you you need your fiber to be twist locked so that when it's twisted together, um, that you can't draw it out any further um, because it's locked together and it's not going to um, fall apart when you're plying. The thing is, is that when we're learning how to do long draw, we tend to add more twists to hold our singles together to make the singles more stable as we're drawing back, as we sort of get into that dance and learn how to do that, um, the dance with our wheel or your supported spindle. We tend to add a lot more twist than we intend. And with spins like this, um, it ends up creating quite a dense singles. Even though we think it's gonna be light and airy, it's actually quite dense. So a couple of things that we can do to diminish that is by stripping down your bats. So really strip them down. The thinner your fiber strip is, the um, thinner your singles are gonna be. And I'm not saying that you wanted a thinner yarn necessarily or, or a lighter gauge necessarily. It's just that if you keep it um, a little bit thinner and you can manage that fiber that's in your hand and work on not adding quite so much twist, then you can keep your singles a little bit lighter, a little bit airier. You, you're not putting quite as much twist in. You don't have as much fiber to manage. The other thing is instead of bats, um, you could have taken the bats and made your um, um, bats into hand carded roll eggs and then again you would have had less fiber in your hand um, a little bit less fiber to deal with and then a lighter grist yarn as a result uh, put your wheel on a higher ratio on a lower ratio so put it on a bigger pulley so if you're let's say you're spinning at like 13 to 1 if you drop down to like 8 to 1 or 6 to 1 um, you're still getting that dance going and you're you're maybe even still treadling faster than you normally would because you want that twist in there but it's not actually building up as much twist so it's keeping the air in there the densest yarn that you can spin is the short short forward because you're pulling forward and smoothing as you go pull forward smooth and so you're taking out all of the air but you can do that too in long draw if you add too much twist so then your singles end up not being as light and airy as you originally thought was we're hoping and you get rid of all of that air because now it's so twisted down and so dense and then you go and make a two ply or a three ply and you've got and then you put a ton of ply twist in and now you've shortened your grist even more because you're if you plied to a really really gentle twist angle like maybe 35 degrees or even 30 degrees and maybe you ended up with like 800 yards per pound but instead you tightened up your twist angle for example and so now let's say your twist angle is like 55 degrees and now you've got a grist of like 650 or 675 yards per pound does that make sense so even just loosening off your your twist angle um, will help to um, lessen or diminish that denseness of that yarn. This is long stapled. You kind of, you, I mean, Sarah answered her own question in in, in her post. Um, these long stapled fibers just don't need that much twist. Um, in a long staple like that, like if her staple was, I, I don't know, because I can only tell from the photo, but like if her, if her staple length was like, you know, four or five inches, um, you really only need two or three twists in that to hold it together. Um, and so then in the plying, you don't need that really, really tight ply because you've got these nice long staples. It's not going to pill unless you've got a lot of shortcuts. And um, you can kind of gently relax that a little bit. I, I hope that helps. Um, I'm just looking at the uh, um, chat channel just because I want to... Um, I want to see what people are asking because there's a couple of questions. Um, Eve said her Perindale is very similar. Yeah, so we did Eve's Perindale a while ago and we had the exact same conversation about, about the tightness and the, and the twist angle, especially because with these longer stapled fibers, I think, I know I want to put more twist in my stuff because I love the look of that cinched up twist angle, um, but I'm learning slowly that you don't necessarily need that really tight twist angle, that you don't need, every single spin doesn't need to be plied to 45 to 55 degrees. Um, and in fact, sometimes you need your yarn to be a little bit less twisted in your singles. I used to spin really, really low twist singles and then I do a really high twist ply and I kind of got away from that in the last year or so. I don't know if I'm going to go back to it 
to that extent, um, but I definitely have started sort of um, backing off a little bit on my singles twist and lessening my ratios a little bit. And then again, adding back that twist in, in the plying. Um, but again, not going quite so tight um, and trying to find that happy medium of where where do you want a hard wearing yarn for like a sweater or a sock, but not so highly twisted that you've got this really dense high, you know, really, I don't know if, if it's necessarily the grist that I'm worried about or more just the hand of the yarn when I'm actually knitting with it. Um, okay, let me just look. Um, the yarn looks lovely. I totally agree. Kelly, everybody really likes your yarn, Sarah. <laughs> um, even though it was dense and, and it made such a heavy sweater. Um, all right, so I never used my lowest ratios, but I did for that one. Yeah, so that's what, so Kelly said this, that's, when we mentioned about lowering the ratio, Kelly said that's what she had to do for her tour de fleece spin. Um, she's never used a low, her lowest ratio, but she did for that one. See, and I think you ended up really liking your results, Kelly, if my mem if my memory serves. Eve said I was told that doing a plyback on a woolen spin, that the plyback should look really bad. <laughs> So I actually think that's probably some really sage advice. Um, I, I I think I think when you do your plyback test when you're wool, when you're spinning woolen, um, that my favorite yarns that I have made where I've done my plyback test and it's been a woolen yarn that I have liked the best have been the ones where my plyback test was like terrible, like where the yarn was just all light and loopy. And it's kind of like when you take uh, singles that you're gonna leave as singles, so like this yarn here, and you loop it back on itself and it's all loopy. Um, this was this is a Wensleydale, so it's gonna be loopy anyways because it's a long stapled fiber. But um, where the plyback test isn't nice and um, twisted together, like it's kind of just, airy and it looks like fiber just kind of twisted together and I don't think I have any examples like right here unfortunately um, but let me see so this was my yarn it was my CVM Suffolk meat merino that I had spun for um, my fireside card uh, sweater which I mentioned last last time so this was my plyback test on it um, not as Low twist is what um, what I'm talking about for a plyback for a woolen spun, but this was a woolen spun yarn. And the grist on this one was only um, just shy of a thousand yards per pound. So um, it wasn't super, super, super um, the, it's not like the grist on that one was so amazing. This was um, my semi amu suffolk. No, this was high high twist. I'm looking for my low twist yarns, but I don't want to waste too much time looking for them. Um, Wensleydale, American Tunis. This was my plyback test for my American Tunis, um, and it was really loose um, and quite airy, but I, with a woolen singles, you would want it to be even more so, um, even more, uh, more light and airy. Um, Yeah, I can't find, oh, here's a good one. So this is my, this is kind of like what I would want. This is worsted, this is a semi-worsted spun. This is my Bastador roving that my friend Nina in Santiago, Chile sent me. Um, but this is quite, quite a low twist singles. And you can see at the top there, up where it says March 2017, I've got, I've got it in my shorthand there, how those singles are all like light and airy and floofy. Um, that's kind of like what I look for when I'm spinning um, long draw when I do my plyback test. I want the I want the the singles and the plyback test to almost not even be discernible, like that you can't even see what one sing what which is one singles and which is the other, and like really really um, barely hanging on, so that if you had it in the plyback, you could actually start pulling it apart. Um, maybe not that low twist, but, but you know, close. Um, I just need to put this back. 
Anyways, I hope that answers Erin's question and addresses her sweater because it's a gorgeous sweater and she did a beautiful job on it and her spinning was amazing. Um, and I think it's really important as a beginner and as a learner um, when we're first getting started because I know she's made other hand spun sweaters since. I think it's really important to take these opportunities to kind of look at this stuff and and, ha and have some a few minutes of reflection and to be able to say, hey, this didn't turn out as well as I wanted to. It was one of my first sweaters, but I've and I've got lots to learn. So I'm just going to move my cameras around. Um, I'm going to talk really, really quickly about this spin. Um, so I put it on my Ashford E spinner, which is back here. I have an Ashford E spinner three. Um, I don't use it very often, but I did pull it out the other day because I was waiting for some stuff to edit and upload. And um, I started spinning this because I had it out. And um, it is, um, it was unfortunately, so this was in my stash for a really long time. And the fiber was quite compacted and quite, um, um, I wouldn't say felted, but it was definitely very fulled in places. And I don't know if that was from the dye process or if it was just from being in my stash. Um, Cause you can see some spots where, and I've already finished this, I've already washed and finished it. I had these big chunks pull through and like it's, it's twist locked. I can't pull it apart or draft it apart or anything, but it's not particularly um, like it's, it's, it's not, particularly nice in sections because it's just you know just drafted forward in such a big clump um, so I decided to make it a thick and thin um, there are some areas that are quite a bit thinner that took a lot more of the twist and then there are some sections that are a little bit thicker so what I'm actually going to do with this I already have a plan for it I'm, I'm going to throw it on my loom um, I, I have borrowed my mum's 10 inch sampler which I had mentioned um, last show or the show before and I'm gonna throw this on there and I'm just gonna see what I get for, um, I'm gonna calculate my yardage. I'm not totally sure what I have for yardage. And I'm going to uh, see if I can um, get a scarf out of it. Um, it's Nora's favorite color, so I might even just do something for her. It'd be kind of small, something something that would just like go around her neck and um, would feature this yarn. Um, Cause I, I'm kind of curious to see what these um, thick and thins would, um, what it would weave up like. I have another thick and thin the um, singles upstairs that uh, you guys might remember it was Sweet Georgia Club from a while ago it was one of the last ones and remember when I went to full the singles it got all tangled and it felted and matted together and it was that big mess the skein that that was just a big mess and I haven't gone through and like detangled that yet but it has purples in it so I was actually thinking I would use one for the warp and use the other for the weft and just see what happens. Um, I might use the Sweet Georgia for the warp if I can get it untangled. I'll probably have to cut out a bunch of the yarn and then use this for the warp and with the two matching purples, I thought it would be really pretty. And it would be really nice to see how these um, sort of thick and thin singles yarns weave and how it, how it um, works up in the weaving, like how it, um, there's a word I'm looking for. Um, how it, um, words, there's a word I'm looking for, how it withstands the weaving, um, being under the tension of the warp and uh, I thought I would do it on my 7.5 dent, uh, heddle and just to, just to see like how, how it does. Um, I, I don't know how many yards this is, like I said, but I suspect it's about 200 and yeah, I'd really like to see just how it, how it turns out. So. I did start, I have so many spins in progress all of a sudden that I don't even know what to do with myself. I'm not going to talk about all of them on the show today because we've got other stuff to talk about like this um, blanket, blanket, <laughs> blanket in the background. Um, but I did start another four ply because I'm a sucker for punishment. Um, this is some hedgehog fibers. It's from my sock, sock superwash stash that I talked about a few shows ago. Um, this is 70% merino. 30% nylon, it's from Hedgehog Fibers. Got it at one of my local knitting shops at Valley Yarns in Surrey. And I did my sample card like a good little girl. So I'm doing a four ply. So what I wanted to see, the colors are crazy. It's a speckle dyed. 
Um, so what I wanted to see was, and so the reason why I'm sharing this today is because um, the other spin is in the other room and it's um, a little bit too complicated to bring it in here. But what I thought I did, I am doing this on my Ashford e-spinner because I've been waiting for a lot of stuff to upload recently. And um, I've actually found it's just really nice to have something on the e-spinner sitting right here in front of me that I can spin on while I'm waiting for stuff to render. So um, here are my singles, uh, short forward, worsted, I've been stripping these down and attenuating them. So attenuate means to pre-draft. So I pre-draft, give the fiber a little bit of a twist to keep it together because of it being merino, superwash merino, so it's really fly away. So I've just been going through it like that and adding a little bit of a twist to it to hold it together nicely. And then um, I spun the singles really, really fine. Obviously they're about 64 wraps per inch, somewhere in there, 58 to 64. And then this is my two ply sample. Uh, yeah, Becca knows about the blanket. So she just said in the chat, oh no, the blanket, tear face, because <laughs> she knows what happened to the blanket. Um, so this is my two ply plyback sample. And then after I had my two ply plyback sample, I took, I, I took some of it off to put on my card and then I added a whole bunch more twists just manually with my hands. And actually, something that works really, really well for doing that is if you put a paper clip at the looped end, um, if you put a paper clip and then twist the paper clip, that works really well to do it manually. And then I made a four ply cable so that I have a general idea of what the four ply is gonna look like. So um, I'll see if I can just zoom in on that so that you guys can really see uh, what the cable looks like because it's amazing. Amazing. Nothing was going my way this weekend, but this did. There you go. So that's the four ply. Um, it is a cable. This yarn is... I'm not going to tell you, it might not be, it might be a cable, it might not be a cable, um, but it, the, this is really pretty and it feels really good too, like it's got the texture of a cable, um, which is neat to feel, um, but it's, and it's a dense, like it's, it's dense because it's, it's tightly twisted, but it's really pretty. Um, so I'm excited about that and I've just been working on it on the side um, uh, when I've been waiting for stuff to render, so. I really encourage you guys to do um, sample cards. I always hammer about them and then I hear people didn't do them and they were disappointed with their with their results and I always just am like, ah, oh, like I totally get it but um, it's just one extra step that really makes a big difference and then if you put it down and you come back to your spinning, um, it makes it, you know, it's, it's, it's good. Um, all right, let's switch your cam my cameras. I'm gonna get rid of the uh, second camera because from now on I just need need this one. So uh, hello, um, my head is all big now. What do you guys want to hear about first? Do you want to hear about my sparkle cardigan or do you want to hear about the blanket? Wah wah wah. They're both wah wahs. So um, if you which, which one do you guys want to hear about first? Because um, they're both kind of upsetting. One is fixable, one is not. <laughs> so I'll let you guys decide. While you decide, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get the two pieces. I did a test knit this past weekend um, while Mike was in Toronto. And I can't talk about it um, on the show just yet, but as soon as I can, I will. It turned out amazing. Um, if you follow me on Instagram, you'll have seen a couple of photos of the wrong side. Uh, Melissa of Knitting the Stash, she always talks about the wrong side of her knitting and how um, she really loves it when the wrong side looks as good as the right side, which I totally agree. And um, this is one of those... Um, projects where you could wear it either way and it looks amazing and I'm, I'm really excited to share it with you guys so one day um one day soon I'll be able to share that with you okay so you guys want to end with the fixable um so the fixable last all right so the blanket the blanket is not fixable <laughs> the blanket is a lesson in being distracted when you are finishing something so um I'm gonna move my chair over so I went to this really interesting talk this has nothing to do with this um, I went to this really interesting talk at James's school um, last Wednesday. It was like the last thing with everything else that was going on and with Mike having to go to Toronto on the spur of the moment. It was the last thing that I wanted to do. But I'm really glad that I went because it was a talk. It was three hours. I thought it would be like an hour, an hour and a half. It was three hours with a question and answer at the end. Um, so it was like four hours. Uh, and it was a talk about boys and um, 
boys learning in class and in classrooms. It was fascinating. Um, I was like, I, I took my knitting, which I got razzed about a bit during the break, um, but it was really interesting because uh, James's teacher was standing right there and I, she was in the conversation with me. And she said, I noticed that you had your knitting out. And she said, I've noticed you knit in the uh, in the school lot a lot, in the playground while the kids play after school. And I said, yeah, I'm, I'm never without my knitting. And she said, uh, she's like, yeah, you're a kin you're a, um, a, a kinetic learner. You're you're a kinesthetic learner. And I was like, I looked at her and I'm like, no, I'm not. I said, I'm a visual learner, but I've never been called a kinetic learner. And she said, yeah, you have to keep your hands busy. She's like, I bet you if you pulled out your knitting, you could and just started knitting. She's like, you could recite everything that was talked about in that talk. So that the next night, Mike got home from work and we were talking over dinner and I was finished dinner. And so I pulled out my knitting because I was working on it because I was working on the sparkle card again. And because I was convinced I was going to have it done for this show. And um, I started telling him everything that had been said in the in the talk. And I was like, oh my goodness, I am a kinetic learner. <laughs> so I didn't know that. I knit my whole way through my master's degree, um, which makes sense. But it's funny. And the talk, one of the things that he talked about was boys need to not be sitting on conventional classroom chairs. Um, they need to be sitting on wobble stools. And that like if you're having trouble with your, your boys at home, and it's nothing, like it's, it was not a bash on boys night. It was very much a boys have so much to teach us. Um, and so much to teach us about learning and the girls don't suffer when you put these things into a classroom. Um, and a lot of the girls actually do do better so um, anyhow, it was it, it was incredible. So Mike and I had a really long talk the next night because like it's hard to get the kids to sit at the dinner table to eat and to focus on the conversation and he doesn't see them all day. So like he wants to hear about their day and wants to hear about like the things that they're doing and, and working on and stuff. So one of the things that he had said in the talk was these wobble stools because then the kids can be moving the whole time. They can be, you know, tipping back and forth and doing all their things. And I said, well, let me price them out and let me see. Because he, like, he really recommended them for in the home. And our kitchen chairs are on their last legs anyways. So we decided to replace two of our kitchen chairs with wobble stools. And I said to Mike, I'm going to get a wobble stool for the office. Because we've been talking about making this a standing desk for about three years now since I started the podcast. And we still haven't done it. So we got a wobble stool for in here. So now I can wobble as I'm talking to you. <laughs> So as I'm moving this over, I'm like, oh, wait, I can't move my wobble stool quite as easily as I could move my chair. Um, that's what made me think of it all. But it was stuff like that that he talked about to really um, um, help boys to do what they need to do in an environment that is often sit still, sit down, stop moving, stop fidgeting, sit down, you know, and um, he said to, he sort of, he said to the educators in the audience, because all of the teachers from the school were there, because um, everybody was invited, so it was a lot of parents, a lot of teachers, all of the EAs were there, so they're the support staff, the ones that work one-on-one -on -one with kids in the classroom, because um, our school has a lot of um, EAs, because that um, you can privately fund them if you want them at our school, so a lot of the kids that in the public system wouldn't necessarily have an EA have them. And so lots of the, like all the EAs came. And um, it was really interesting because the, um, um, he said, he kind of said to the educators, like how often, how many times per day do you ask your kids to sit still and to sit down? And he said, as a kinetic move boy and as a learner and as, a, as an adult, he's like, I don't want to sit down. I, I, why do I have to sit down to do my numbers and my letters at my desk? Why can't I stand? And that was what um, kind of started the conversation. It was really interesting. Um, the name of the lecturer was Mark, M-A-R-C Landry, L-A-N-D-R-Y. He's an occupational therapist and he specializes in sensory perception in children. Um, so his specialty is kids who can't cope with their um, with the sensory input that they receive from their environment. So his his um, wheelhouse, if you will, is kids who can't cope with um, being on the playground with all these other kids and, um, um, you know, have breakdowns or all that different stuff. So um, he lives in Hawaii and he um, comes up to Vancouver quite regularly for um, various things. He's got clients that he follows all over North America and actually in Europe now too. And so, and his website's, um, it's, it's pretty good. It's not amazing, but it's pretty good. So M-A-R-C, Mark Landry, L-A-N-D-R-Y. So really, really interesting. Um, 
stool with a top that is designed to wobble a bit, keep them slightly off balance. Oh yeah, so you guys are asking what a wobble stool is. You know what, Eve, I'll show you. <laughs> We're getting really off topic here, guys. Um, and I'm totally cognizant of your time. So if you guys can't stick around, I totally understand. But this is a wobble stool. So these are not expensive versions of the wobble stool. You can spend $300 on a wobble stool if you want. Um, these ones are actually from Ikea, which wasn't my first choice. Um, but it meant that we could get three and get them right now because the other ones were up to six to nine months waiting for shipping. And I just wanted to get something into our home as quickly as possible, being totally honest. So, all right. Um, oh, desk cyclers. Yeah, he talked about that, about introducing desk cyclers. Um, he talked about desk cyclers and he also talked about... Um, um, standing desks, so having a whole row at the back of the room of standing desks. Um, what else do you talk about? Oh, uh, movement. So if your boys are really, really, um, and we've done this with James, and his teacher started doing it with the boys too, and it works like, it just works like a hot damn. Um, get them to do heavy work. So <laughs> he's talking about these schools. I'm totally getting off topic, but just bear with me. Um, so anytime kids, and I mean, adults are the same, right? We're meant to move. We're meant to, you know, um, um, be physical. Um, they have, they've introduced in these schools that he's worked in where the kids, um, when they're getting really squirrely and they can't sit and they can't focus and they can't do their thing, um, they have this box and it's like, you know, a like a, a box that you would get like paper in so two columns of paper like the big um, copy boxes they fill them with weights <laughs> and it sounds really mean but they say to the kids like you know if James can't sit still and he's wobbling around and you can't you can't focus they'll say oh James that box needs to get taken down to the office like can you take it down to the office for me so rather than sitting out in the hallway and telling him to sit still um, or penalizing him go take the box down to the office so he has to so it's his job right so he goes takes it down to the office and then you know later that day oh Johnny you can't sit still you're really having a trouble a lot of trouble focusing why don't you go help us out and do a job instead and give you a bit of a break can you go to the office and get that really heavy box and bring it back <laughs> and apparently it works wonders um, because kids lifting heavy things and moving heavy things, it settles their CNS right down. Um, so one of the things she talked about was, um, or he talked about, sorry, was um, chair sit-ups. So getting the kids to put their hands by their side and lift themselves up and do that three or four times, it settles their CNS right down. Um, and doing these heavy work instead of um, penalizing them for not being able to sit still. So really, really, really interesting stuff. Um, all right. On topic. <laughs> you guys are terrible about getting me off topic. This is my woven blanket from last time. It wasn't finished last time. I was I fit I don't think I was finished the fringe yet. I was just gonna start working on the fringe. Um this past weekend was crazy. Mike, like I mentioned, was in Toronto. Um and I had the kids all weekend, obviously. Um, I had to get taken off my shifts, um, which is a whole rigmarole in and of itself because we didn't have any um, childcare this past weekend because my parents were away. Don't ever finish your weaving <laughs> when you may or may not be interrupted. <laughs> I should have left this until this week when Nora was at school. I shouldn't have done it when I did it. I thought I had this window of about half an hour and I got interrupted literally no word of a lie six times and it felted it's completely felted um, when I pulled it out of the soapy water wash it was perfect um, I could still see through the fabric the yarn had had um, fluffed up like pl plumped up it looked amazing but you could still see through it because um, I wove this at a really really light um, I don't know what you would call it in weaving, but it, was, it wasn't it was a very dense weave. Um, I wove it at, um, I think it was 10 dents per inch. So 10 picks per inch, 10 dents per inch. So um, I probably could have gone down to 15 because the yarn was, was uh, a light, light fingering. It's now quite dense. Um, anybody who doesn't know that this isn't how it was supposed to be finished wouldn't even think twice they would think this was really beautiful it's a great stole it's got enough structure to it now because of the felting that it's still soft but it sits around the neck really really nicely like it's almost like a cape now or like a cape stole and it comes down low enough at the back 
that I, I think it actually is quite pleasing and there's a little bit of a faux plaid in there which is kind of cool so I didn't lose all of the color nuances in this um, but it's over finished compared to what I had hoped for so and some of my fringe came undone in the wash so um, when I threw it into my dryer my plan was to only throw it in for three minutes and it was probably in there for about 20 so it was completely my fault and I just feel really sad about it to be honest um, I'm just really bummed I'm not saying it's not a beautiful finished product um, it is soft it is fuzzy you're right Megan <laughs> uh, it does look beautiful I'm I'm coming around to it I've been able to process now over the last few days about what happened and I'm kind of coming around to it I even actually quite like the look of it here with the shawl pin like I actually quite like this I would even probably put this in the guild sale um, they finished with the call for it and everything's been juried already but I would actually probably put this into the guild sale um, I, I might even hang on to it for next year and put it in next year because um, it really is a beautiful stole it just was never meant to be a stole it was supposed to be um, a blanket it was supposed to be significantly bigger um, and it's just a bummer you know like when you have a vision for something and you spin all of that yarn and you finish it off and you do all that weaving um, and it, you're right it is beautiful it's just uh, you know um, I could actually see my mom wearing this um, there she would look really really nice in this whether she actually would is another question I don't know um, but you're right it is really pretty the only thing you can you can't see I'm wearing black but you can't really see it on the camera um, the alpaca is really shedding now so before um, it was it there, there was alpaca in it and like I could smell it because I'm a little bit allergic to alpaca and I'm just a little bit sensitive to it but now I can really I, the alpaca is like really coming out of it and our dryer um, lint trap thing was just chalk a block with alpaca all the little fuzzies all the little like they're not guard hairs but just all the little alpa alpaca bits are all coming out so, which I thought was kind of interesting I'm not sure what's up with that it's hard when you have a project that you have in mind that you have a certain end goal and an end end thought in that you're working towards and then and then it all goes sideways and part of it's my fault because I shouldn't have finished it when I did but I honestly didn't think that I would be interrupted so this is how big it is finished and it is really pretty it's really warm um, I've got, I went through before I finished it and um, fixed all the mistakes um, it's a little bit there's a part in the warp or the weft like in the, in the weaving that doesn't sit quite right and I think it just needs to be pressed um, right in there you can see where it gapes a little bit um, I think it just needs to be pressed right in here um, right over here I think it just needs to be pressed I haven't pressed it yet and I think it just needs a little bit of a, a light iron now that I'm not worried about ruining it further um, I can just lightly lightly iron, um, lightly press it all right let's finish on a happy note well at least this is fixable the sparkle cardigan is finished I use finished loosely it's it fits me perfectly um, in the body um, I got buttons for it now this lace is all gonna relax and finish um, quite a bit more open and and quite a bit more um, like it, I haven't washed it or blocked it or anything because it's not actually done which I'll tell, tell you about in a minute um, so this is all gonna um, relax and open up and also fit uh, a little bit better through the hips because it it's still un, unwashed and unblocked so I finished the sleeves um, they are ginormous they're not even kind of ginormous they are absolutely ginormous so I have to go back and rip the whole sleeves out I tried them on several times as I was knitting them like I do I often even put on garments like on during the show and show you guys so I was really surprised when I finished it and when I put it on how big the sleeves are um, they fit through here and then from here to about here they're enormous and I'm not talking like an inch too big or like an inch and a half or two inches too big I'm talking like five to six inches too big like I have to take out like a significant portion of the sleeve for it to fit um, 
I don't know why my gauge is exactly the same as it was on the body of the cardigan. My stitch gauge was right. I felt like I have no idea why the sleeves are so much bigger. Um, I did notice on the sample and I've noticed on people's Ravelry project pages that the sleeves definitely have a little bit more ease. Um, I don't know if that's because of how many stitches you had to pick up through the arm sky, but it fits in the arm sky perfectly. Um, and then I did a tubular cast off for the cuffs which turned out beautifully, but now I have to try to get it out. Um, and a tubular bind off um, is a sewn bind off, so it's gonna take a lot of just sitting quietly with a tapestry needle and unpicking it. Um, obviously I didn't, I didn't weave in any of my ends, I tried it on right away, and Mike said to me, that looks really great, but your sleeves are really big. <laughs> You know it's big when even my husband, who doesn't pick up on anything, notice. So I am going to have to rip them out. I'm only going to rip them out to here. And then I'm going to do some rapid decreases through here. Um, all the way through like that first inch. Uh, probably actually the more like the first three inches. I'll do, um, like I'll probably diminish by about 10 stitches, which is a lot. But I'll try it on um and see how it goes and i'm going to finish one entire sleeve before i start the other one so that if i have to rip it back again um i'll only have to rip back one the other thing is the sleeve so my arms are quite long my my arms from my underarm to my thumb more sweater fitting i'm going to move over a little bit so you guys can see my whole arm from here to here the knuckle of my uh hand is uh 20 to almost 23 inches um so as soon as i put this on this comes way down to like here like it, the sleeves are too long um but when i had the sweater on just the way that it fits and the way that it looks i actually think that i would prefer to have sleeves that end like more like here so not three quarter length but kind of cropped um because i can see how this isn't a sweater that i want to be pushing up my sleeves um it's too tailored and too nice and i want it to be really really wearable so i don't want to be constantly pushing at the sleeves because it'll eventually stretch this out really really badly um and because the tubular bind off is a little bit firmer it's stretchy it works really well at the top of socks um it's not a bind off that you can fold back very easily though so I wouldn't want to have the sleeves to here and then be constantly rolling them I would want it to just end so that they're kind of out of my way and that but not so short that it doesn't look that it becomes like a, a two season or, or even a one season cardigan if that makes sense I hope that makes sense so I'm gonna um bye Megan back to work um I'm gonna knit the sleeves shorter and I'm gonna more rapidly decrease. So I don't know if this will be done for next show or not. I think it'll probably be in progress next show. Um, it depends on if we end up having to go to Toronto or not and if I get all of that plain knitting time, we'll see. Um, so I will keep you posted, but that's kind of where I'm at with that and it just is kind of a bummer. I did get beautiful buttons at my local yarn shop at 88 Stitches. They're yellow. They've got little pink and purple flowers on them. They're really pretty. I'm still torn about over dyeing this. I kind of want to leave it as it is, but I also kind of want to dye it. I need to talk to Katrina because um, she said she would help me. So I'm going to hold her to it. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I'm going to think about it. Anyhow, that is that project. So thank you so much for listening to me and thanks for getting off topic with me today. We talked about a lot of stuff. I hope everybody is doing really, really well, um, and I hope that you have a wonderful and safe Halloween for those who celebrate it in, in your country. I know not every country celebrates it. Um, oh, Eve just has a quick question. As in cut out the bit that's too big and then graph the top and bottom, that way you don't have to pull out the bind off. I thought about that, but because of the lace pattern, I'd have to have the grafting absolutely perfect and in the exact perfect right spot. Um, I feel like it would just be easier to rip it back. But I might think about that some more. I had thought about that. The other thing I was thinking about was the, the body of the sweater is knit on 3.5 millimeter needles, but I was actually thinking about going back and because I did the arm sky on 3.5 millimeter needles because um, 
Just the way that the stitches are picked up through here, I wanted it to be a little bit tighter gauge. Um, and so I was thinking about knitting the whole sleeve on 3.5 millimeters instead of 3.75 just to tighten up the gauge a little bit. I don't think it's enough to that the naked eye would notice a difference between the two. So I'm just thinking about all of these different things. Um, anyways, happy safe Halloween and um, until next time, happy spinning everybody. And again to the patrons, the show will be available tonight. And then for everybody else, it'll be available on Friday or Saturday morning. So until next time, happy spinning. Bye guys.